Um, okay, last one from my side. Uh, this one is on higher order topological insulators, a form of topological crystalline insulators. And this is a rather recent subject. Um, that this lecture could have equally well been given by Andre, who pioneered this with this paper, and then um, also I got involved uh, with this uh, more recent paper, and a lot of people's on, people on this paper are actually here also. Uh, Frank, Ashley, Maya, uh, Andre. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so the, the basic idea is um, uh, can we sort of uh, bring this bulk boundary correspondence of topological phases to a slightly different level? And um, uh, so, so the simplest place to start again is our Sushi for Hega model. And so you remember this was this dimerized chain. Um, and we had this one end state uh, that, that was dangling here. And that is in 1D, as you see. And, uh, and now uh, the question that uh, I would like to ask is if we have a two-dimensional system, um, could we uh, have a situation where uh, the bulk of the system is gapped, the edge is gapped, but we have a state at the corner that is uh, gapless? like this end state of the sushri for hager uh, chain. So topological corner state. So, uh, and, and the point should be that this is a property of the bulk of the system. Of course, I can always engineer some one dimensional system where there is some state here, so uh, I can glue it to some bulk that is trivial. That's not the idea. The idea is I give you a bulk of a system, you compute something in the bulk, and then when I cut the system and make uh, make a corner, uh, you can predict, you can tell me from the bulk, uh, from looking at the bulk electronic structure, whether the corner will have such a topological uh, mode. And um, so the way I'm uh, uh, gonna uh, introduce that is that this corner mode is protected again, since we are talking about uh, crystalline symmetries, is, is protected by a non-local symmetry, and that is the mirror uh, symmetry that, um, you know, is given by the mirror reflection that goes through the corner, okay? So, so let, let's just think about this dimerization picture from the sushi for Heger model, because it's really convenient, and see whether we can extend that to 2D. So if we have a lattice and um, what we kind of want to do is we want to dimerize it in such a way that, that we passivate everything in the bulk and on the edges and, uh, and only that corner remains. So for example, we could think of making bonds here, right? Um, and then all the edges are gone and then maybe we can make some bonds here and, and then everything in the bulk is gone, right? So you get, you get the idea? Ah, sorry. And um, and the unit cell in this case would be containing four atoms, right? Um, so unfortunately, this does. So it's certainly mirror symmetric, right? Um, but uh, it doesn't quite work because if you think about these four sides here, uh, what I what these bonds mean is basically a hopping integral, right? And then I think about it's like a little loop with four sides. So when I take a cosine band. And, uh, and I have four sides, and I have momentum at uh, pi, uh, plus or minus pi half, and, and zero, right? And then you see that the energy spectrum of this little four sides would be gapless. There are two states exactly at zero energy, so that doesn't work. Um, what we can do to, uh, to change this is we can insert a, a flux here in this plaquette, uh, a pi flux, and that sh shifts the energy eigenvalues exactly by half, right, between the two. So now, if, if, if I put a pi, in the a pi flux in the plaquette, the four uh, energy eigenvalues are these, are these four crosses that I, that I draw here. So now it's gapped, okay? So when I put a pi flux in this little plaquette, the bulk is gapped. And, and that's exactly uh, the, the model that was proposed in this paper. Um, you put a pi flux on every, every plaquette, also on these ones. Uh, the difference is, however, that you have some dimerization um, in such a way that, uh, that you, know, you have these strong bonds here that are between the unit cell 
and within the unit cell, you have weak bonds, okay? And then you, from the fully dimerized picture, you already saw that there is this end mode somehow left over. But, um, but that's really just a sort of a sketch, so let's have a look uh, how we can understand this from a top, more topological point of view. And uh, I'll, uh, I want to study this from, say, three different perspectives. Uh, perspectives. Um, so the first one is going to be, I'll, I'll look at the Suschrieffer-Heger-like uh, uh, structure. So first of, uh, on the diagonal. So, um, so far I have not really talked about the mirror symmetry much that is here in the diagonal. So, so if I look at the, at the diagonal, then the model really looks like um, in this uh, fully dimerized limit, let's say, it looks like a bunch of, of these um, plaquettes that are completely disconnected and have pi flux, right? And, um, and it goes on like this. And um, so the Hamiltonian that would, uh, course, that would describe such a pi flux uh, plaquette here um, if I label the sides like one, two, three, and four, then my Hamiltonian, there is a hopping from one to two from, uh, and from four to one. And then let me put, to make the pi flux, uh, uh, let me put a minus one when I hop from one to four or four to one. And then the Hamiltonian looks like that. Okay, so that would be the Hamiltonian for one of these plaquettes. And, um, and the mirror symmetry uh, for this object, um, so obviously uh, sides uh, one and three get interchanged by this mirror symmetry, so it would be something like this, and side two uh, remains where it is, and then uh, I need to make sure that this mirror symmetry is compatible with the pi flux, uh, and that means that it's kind of combined with the gauge transformation that's taken care of by this minus sign when I act on side four. So you can convince yourself that this mirror symmetry commutes with this Hamiltonian, yes? Um, so, for, for one, it's uh, time reversal symmetric, and um, yeah, it's, it's time reversal symmetric. That's a nice, nice one. Um, but what you actually want is that. Um, so, the mirror symmetry is supposed to not change uh, this flux, right, up to this gauge transformation or, or combined with this gauge transformation. So, when you put like a flux that's not pi, um, it will it will be flipped to, to minus the flux value, and pi flux has the convenience that pi and minus pi is the same thing. It's like a little magnetic field that's in pointing going through this, and then when you apply a mirror symmetry uh, that's in the plane perpendicular, the magnetic field will be flipped. And this magnetic field, since we are on a lattice, is, is, is basically invariant under this uh, operation because it's just pi and minus, or the modulo two pi only defined. So, um, so if I was to, so it's basically because it's, it needs to be, uh, it's like a spinful mirror symmetry, if, in, in, or it's, it's a mirror symmetry that has to be combined with a gauge transformation in order for this, uh, uh, for this to be uh, symmetry of the system. Because you see the Hamiltonian, the hoppings that I've chosen is one, 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 minus one, right? So you, see, you would say, oh, this is not mirror symmetric, but it's, the physics is mirror symmetric. It's only that the gauge breaks the mirror symmetry, and I have to correct for that uh, with choosing this mirror symmetry. Because the physical system is obviously mirror symmetric. Right. Okay, so um, now the point is that I can um, basically uh, diagonalize the Hamiltonian. This mirror symmetry uh, uh, has eigenvalues plus and minus one, and it's two, uh, two eigenstates with, with eigenvalue plus one and two eigenstates with eigenvalue minus one. And so if I diagonalize the Hamiltonian in, in the mirror basis, so I can sort of write H twiddle, let's say, um, 
and I diagonalize this. This is the part with mirror eigenvalue plus one. This is the part with mirror eigenvalue minus one. There is no off-diagonal elements. And if I, if I do that, and if, you know, I get um, the following structure. And I should also say that uh, in this whole process, I keep a uh, chiral symmetry, C, um, which is, you could already almost guess what it is. It's um, diagonal one minus one, one minus one, okay? And um, so, So what you now see is that this exactly looks like the fully dimerized Hamiltonian of an SSH chain, but in each mirror subspace, right? So it's, it's like, this is of course the Hamiltonian that, that um, mediates the hopping, you know, just within it, like this uh, little thing. So it, in the SSH language, it would be the hopping intra, uh, sorry, inter the unit cells, right? So, so this, okay, well, the square root of two doesn't really matter, but um, so this, this promotes hopping between the unit cells, um, and it's the same thing in the, in the plus and minus uh, subspace. And, um, and so, so basically what we see is this like two SSH chains, okay, one in each, one in each mirror subspace. So you would think, well, then there should be two end states maybe, right? Because that's what we thought about for the morning lectures. If we have two SSH chains, there should be one comes with each, uh, each comes with one end state. But uh, here due to this corner geometry, you see that the bulk boundary correspondence is, is altered, right? So if I, so far, when I draw this, uh, these, little uh, rectangles, uh, these little squares here, these rhomboedra, I draw these here, right? This one and this one and so forth. So the last unit cell, the way this corner terminates is that there's just one side sitting, one side of type two sitting here, so say, and nothing else, right? So in this last unit cell, there's only this one side. So even though there's these two chains, there's only one uh, end state that's sitting at the corner. And, and that has a definite mirror eigenvalue, as you can see, right? So the two is, is mirror eigenvalue plus, right? Okay, so that's the first way of, of seeing that there is an end state explicitly, and then there is some connection to SSH physics. Um, but I think we can make it a little, um, a little more explicit in the, in the second way of doing things. And for that, I'll, I'll write down an actual Hamiltonian for this system. So, so we'll go to, uh, to a momentum space and uh, the hoppings on, on these weak bonds, I will have uh, with strength one and the strong bonds will have strength lambda. And then the Hamiltonian for this thing, um, I'll first write it down, explain then. This is gonna be Okay, so this is how the Hamiltonian looks, but I have to explain you what, what the, um, how the indices work. So the four sides in the unit cell, I label them by uh, pairs zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. And this, I, this is like an I and J index. Each of them can be, can be zero or one. And then, um, so the sigma is our Pauli matrices acting 
on I and the tau are Pauli matrices acting on J. Okay, so part of the terms we can immediately understand, right? So there is uh, these one terms, they are the ones that are, that are really mediating the hopping within the unit cell, right? And then everything else multiplies lambda, and that's how, uh, basically, that's just how the, uh, the helping between the unit cells uh, turns out to be. So, so now this system is in the topological phase for lambda larger than one. And for, for lambda equal to one, obviously it's, it's gapless, it's just some some pi flux model on the square lattice, which is actually having Dirac cones, and, and for lambda less than one, it's, it's in the trivial phase, right? So that's where, where all the uh, orbitals are just hybridized within the unit cell. Okay, so in this representation, I can also write down the, the, uh, the, uh, the diagonal symmetry explicitly, and it's not super enlightening, but I'll just, for completeness, write it down so that you see there's no magic happening. It's a little bit complicated looking. It exchanges a few of these uh, Pauli matrices, and uh, and that's why it has this is a bit more richer structure. Okay, so this is the the symmetry that sends. Um, so, so this is this diagonal mirror symmetry essentially. And um, and now uh, what I want to uh, show you is that uh, the, the, I want to basically show you the topological index of this system. And uh, this topological index is defined on the mirror invariant line in momentum space, similar to what we had uh, before with these mirror invariant planes for, churn, uh, for mirror churn numbers and so forth. So this time the mirror invariant lines are are these two, right? Like, I mean, the, if we think of both of these diagonal mirror symmetries, so there's this mxy, this mxy bar, um, these mirror symmetries. So we want to compute an invariant on this line, okay? And so, um, so on this line, the Hamiltonian can be, so the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are also eigenstates, they can be chosen to be eigenstates of this mirror symmetry. And, um, and so uh, I can, write down this H tilde in, in momentum space on uh, if I choose Kx equal to K and Ky equal to K, so on this diagonal, and then um, it takes this form, there's four zeros here, and then this form where this uh, Q plus minus is just a function that we have almost uh, seen already today. So again, this, this is a decomposition into mirror subspaces. So this is the mirror subspace plus, and this is the mirror subspace minus. And the fact that um, then there's also the chiral symmetry, which basically makes this off diagonal. And, um, and this Q plus minus of K is equal to square root of two times one plus lambda times e to the minus plus i k. Okay, so have we seen this form before today or with something very similar? Well, we have because that is basically the sushi for Heger model, right? So this is basically exactly the off-diagonal component of the sushi for Heger uh, Hamiltonian. And so what this Hamiltonian on the diagonal in, in K space is, is really uh, uh, a sushi for Heger model uh, in each mirror subspace. There is one subtlety and that is this different sign here uh, in the uh, exponential. And so if I compute uh, basically this winding number invariant, call nu plus minus in these uh, currently uh, in these systems with um, uh, with charge conjugation symmetry or chiral symmetry that they, you can always define it in terms of this Q. It's given by um, 
by this integral, well, trace of q plus minus partial k. Okay, so it's, it's basically just the way here. We don't even need the trace, it's just this thing. Um, then we find that this is plus or minus one, uh, this winding number. Maybe I should not call it nu because nu was in different units before. It's plus or minus one uh, for the two subspaces, so it's opposite. So what does that tell me? Well, first of all, it tells me that if I sum the two up, I get zero. So there is no uh, dipole moment or no, or no polarization um, in this system, in this direction, no net polarization. But there is a sort of a mirror graded uh, you know, number that I could define, right? I could say I, I'm interested in plus, minus, and minus over two or something. And that is now one. And that's, of course, only defined because I have this mirror symmetry. And, um, and this, is, this is one for, for lambda larger than zero, uh, larger than one, and for lambda less than one, uh, this n is equal to zero. So then it's topologically trivial. Okay, so that would be a, a, a way to define a topological, a bulk topological index that guarantees, uh, that's basically describing this phase and guarantees the existence of this corner mode. Um, as long as these edges are gapped, of course, right? So when you manipulate them and make them accidentally gapless, um, then, then there's no well-defined corner mode, but the idea is that you look at the generic symmetry allowed edge termination and generic terminations will be gapped because there's nothing that prevents them from being gapped. Okay, that was number two. And now um, the third look at a topology um, will be using Dirac uh, Hamiltonians. So um, so this Hamiltonian, um, when you look near the phase transition, um, you see that, uh, so when lambda is nearly one, uh, you see that there is, the, the phase transition happens by a gap closing at pi pi, so at, at this point in the Brillouin zone here. And so we can um, basically expand the Hamiltonian around this point. So this is third option. And so this is basically sort of Dirac picture. And uh, so then the Hamiltonian, and we call it H Dirac, expanded around um, uh, so k is equal to pi pi plus this p. So so the p is the the, the, the k dot p Hamiltonian. Huh? So um, that is one minus lambda sigma one tau zero um, plus one minus lambda sigma two tau two plus lambda times p x sigma two tau three minus lambda py sigma two tau one. Okay, so, so what do we see here? Um, well, maybe one minus lambda is a little bit, you know, it's a small number, so let me just replace that by delta. Okay, let me call that delta. Um, so what do we see here? What is this? It's a two-dimensional uh, Hamiltonian. These two matrices anti-commute. This also anti-commutes, this anti-commutes. Everything anti-commutes, okay? So this is a 2D Dirac Hamiltonian with two mass terms. And these two mass terms are tuned to be equal. And um, why are they equal? It's because, because of this mirror symmetry. So mxy or mxy bar times sigma one tau zero times mxy bar inverse turns out to be sigma two tau two. So if I take this first term, apply the mirror symmetry, I get this second one. Okay, so we have a Dirac equation with two equal mass terms. And now let's, let's see what, uh, what we can do. Um, we want to solve uh, for this corner, uh, corner mode. And, um, so we need to look at the corner geometry, and now we'll do a little, uh, little bit of acrobatics. 
with this Dirac equation. So, um, so this corner geometry, um, let's say my topological material occupies this, this quarter of, of space, okay? So here I have, um, let, let me now, so basically the idea is now that these masses have a spatial variation, yeah? And, and we want to see whether there's any topological bound states associated with this spatial variation. So, uh, in fact, uh, let me write this even yet a little differently. I'll write this as two general mass terms that can vary in space. So, um, the, this one is M1 and this one is M2. I'll call this M1 and M2. And so here in the bulk, we have M1 equal to M2 equal to delta. And outside, I also have M1 equal to M2 because of the mirror symmetry, but equal to minus delta. So that's the general trick in these sort of uh, uh, Dirac descriptions of topological systems that to go to the trivial phase, we revert uh, the sign of the mass, okay? And then we see what we got. Now the question that we have to decide on is what do we do on these surfaces? And uh, now this mirror symmetry is not on every given surface, it doesn't impose any restriction, so I can choose the mass differently there. And uh, I'll choose it, for example, M1 equal to, uh, not equal to zero here, and M2 equal to zero near the surface. And then the mirror symmetry flips uh, these, the M1 and M2, right? And it maps, of course, this surface to the other surface, so when I choose this on that surface, the other surface has to have M1 equal to zero, and M2 not equal to zero, okay? And so what is, what is happening here? Well, so, so suppose, I, I know that this is, since it's a Dirac Hamiltonian, everything is gapped away from this corner, right? So away, you know, if I go far away here, uh, there's always some mass term, right? Everywhere, in any direction. So it's always a gapped system. The only question is, is it, is it gonna be gapped at this corner as well or is there something interesting? And now I can carefully basically look at what I've constructed. So here I have two masses which are equal to delta. If I look at the space of M1 and M2, for example, I have two masses which are equal to delta. Out here I have two masses which are equal to minus delta, yeah? So I'm there. And then if I think about going, um, so on a circle here, around this, then here I have M1 not equal to zero, M2 equal to zero, so I went down here, and then, well, I go to this place, and uh, on, the other, uh, on the other surface, I have M2 not equal to zero, and M1 equal to zero, so I'll, I, I, I go there, okay? So what I have done, if I, if I go around this, uh, this point, this corner, I have a winding in the, in the masses, in these two masses, right? So spatially, there is a, there is a winding happening uh, as I go far away from the corner around this point. And that is imposed by this mirror symmetry because if I choose this like that, I have to have the opposite, uh, the opposite mass here. Uh, I mean, the, the M, M1 and M2 switched. Okay, and now, um, uh, since I don't have that much time to explain this in all detail, I'll, I'll um, you know, hope that you would allow me to modify the structure a little bit and optimize basically for a convenient um, analytical solution. Um, and that can be done if I, if I linearize, uh, if I linearize this mass dependence in, in uh, position space. And uh, I wanna do this in the following way. If I uh, write, uh, first of all, I will go to complex coordinates. So x plus i y is gonna be called z. And then um, minus i p x uh, plus p y is uh, equal to partial set bar. You can verify that if you want. And um, minus i p 
x plus py minus ipy is going to be partial set and um, and then well x minus iy is set bar right so this is just a convenient notation and uh, I would like to choose the following um, I would like to choose the following spatial dependence of the masses I want to use m1 plus i m2 equal to z or m1 minus i m2 equal to z bar okay so what these masses do is basically they form a vortex uh, in, in position space essentially and this is also a vortex and uh, why can I do that? Well, the point is everything here is gapped. The only point where something interesting could happen is at this corner. And if I now verify that with this choice of masses, I get a zero energy state at the corner because I have this chiral, an isolated zero energy state, right? Because I have this chiral symmetry, I can deform the Hamiltonian from the sort of physical uh, the spatial dependence of the masses to this sort of idealized one and, um, and nothing else can happen. Uh, because it stays kept uh, everywhere except at this isolated point. Uh, so, so it turns out that uh, this Hamiltonian here, um, this H Dirac, then goes into a Hamiltonian that looks like like follows. Um, so it has set bar, partial set, partial set bar, set. And then the Hermitian conjugate down here. Oh, let me write down the Hermitian conjugate. Um, Z, Z bar minus partial Z minus partial Z bar. Okay, so that would be um, in in some pro appropriately chosen basis. I you know I can't go through all the details. Would be this Hamiltonian. And then the point is that um, there are actually two zero energy modes uh, that this Hamiltonian can support. Um, I can quickly write them down for you. So one is e to the minus z z bar times zero zero one one, and the second one. Um, is e to the z squared plus z bar squared times one one zero zero. So basically, they are zero energy modes of this block and of that block. But um, but we also want, if we want the bound state, we also want that uh, the, the modes are normalizable. And this guy here is not normalizable because of this weird uh, dependence on z and z uh, bar squared. So it's not normalizable. So, so we found this guy, and this is just a Gaussian you know, drop off in all directions. So we've found this guy as a unique zero energy solution, that, that it's unique, you, you, know, you can sit down in peace and quiet and check. But, uh, but this is a unique zero energy solution of this Hamiltonian, which, uh, which sits at this corner, okay? And again, this Hamiltonian doesn't look quite like, like this one here because I've chosen this sort of linear dependence on, of the, on the masses, but now you know, I can um, you know, deform it into this one, uh, into the physical one, just by, you know, by uh, doing manipulations that will not affect, um, uh, that will not affect uh, the fact that everything is gapped except for this one mode. And then again, we have chiral symmetry, so this mode is pinned by chiral symmetry to exactly zero energy. Okay. Okay, so um, I hope that was not too fast, but um, that should be the, uh, almost the end of the story in, in 2D. Let me make one more remark. And that is, um, if you take this system here, and um, that would be a fourth, it's like a bonus uh, thing now, uh, a fourth way to look at the topology is actually a rather important one and the central one in, the, in uh, Andre's paper. Um, if, if you look at um, 
the, the Wilson loops, the Wilson loop spectrum of the system, uh, what would happen? Um, so this system, uh, let's say we want to compute the Wilson loop in this, in this direction, in the y direction, okay. So what would you expect? How would the Wilson loop spectrum look like? We said that there is a correspondence between topological, like the boundary, right? And, and, and the, so the boundary spectrum and the Wilson loop spectrum. So is the boundary uh, gapped or gapless? That's gapped, okay, perfect. So we would also expect that the Wilson loop spectrum is gapped, right? And that's in, indeed true, so So the Wilson loop spectrum, this is a four band model, right? So the Wilson loop spectrum, um, let's say theta as a function of this kx then. Um, so this is for the y Wilson loop say. Uh, it will have two bands, but they, there's no, nothing that topologically makes them uh, you know, stick together or anything, right? There's no degeneracies that are enforced, so it's gapped. But then you can ask, you can take this uh, again as a, uh, a system that is, uh, you know, describing a one-dimensional electronic structure, if you wish. So the Wilson loop, uh, you know, you can write it as e to the uh, i times some Hamiltonian, some some so-called Wilson loop Hamiltonian, and and the question is, what is the electronic structure of this of this one-dimensional system? And it turns out that these bands are actually carrying. Uh, uh, as the Sushri for Heka model, they are carrying half uh, integer polarization. So they are one dimensional, this is a one dimensionally non trivial uh, band structure. Okay? So if you compute the Wilson loop of the Wilson loop, so the Wilson loop of this band structure, then you would get uh, a non trivial, uh, non -trivial answer. You'd get a state at, at, at half. Okay? Uh, it's non-trivial band structure. Okay, that just um, as a side remark. Now, um, now I will go to 3D uh, quickly, and um, and that will be really simple. Um, and we'll, I want to show you that these higher order topological insulators also exist in, in, in three dimensions. So I take this Hamiltonian that I have. I set lambda equal to one now for simplicity. And um, I want to interpolate between the trivial and the topological case, similar to what I did before with the, um, with the Sushri for Heger model by adding another momentum. And the way I can interpolate is by basically just putting this cosine kz here yeah, and and then we know that there is a phase transition, um, uh, basically at, at kz equal to pi over two, um, at kz equal to zero, uh, this will be in the topological phase. At kz equal to pi, it will be in the trivial phase. And to make sure that the thing stays gapped, I can put this sine kz times something that is anti-commuting with everything else, let's say uh, sigma three times tau zero, okay? So, so this way I've just created a simple model um, that, uh, that has what phenomenology now? Uh, you can almost infer it um, just by inspection. Um, so, so I'll draw this now for a system which has open boundary conditions in x and y direction, but periodic boundary conditions in the z direction. Okay, so it's like a like a, a nano wire or something that's running in the z direction. And um, so, what is the spectrum? So th there's one good quantum number, and that is kz. Okay, that I want to keep as good quantum number. And um, so, at kz equal to zero, I said I have this. Uh, uh, 
it's actually called the quadrupole insulator, this, this uh, you know, 2D higher order phase. And that has these four corner states. At each corner, there's one corner state. And then it has its bulk bands, right? And then case that equal to pi, I have a trivial insulator here and here. There's bands, but there's nothing, uh, uh, there's no, uh, no corner modes or anything. And now the, the way to, to uh, connect these four corner states to the bulk bands at, at pi, we can again fi figure this out by uh, using the chiral symmetry of this model, which I haven't even told you yet. But, um, but the chiral symmetry, and this is very much in, in, uh, analogous to what we did in the 2D case when we looked at the mirror symmetric uh, model in class A3, the chiral symmetry is sigma 3 tau 0 times h of kx, ky, kz is equal to minus h of kx, ky, minus kz. Okay, so that tells me, and again, this is local in kx and ky, so it's local in x and y. So what it tells me is that um, if I have one of these corner states that moves upwards here, it has to move downward here, okay? And now I have four of these guys. And if you go through the analysis, you'll find that there's two that move uh, this way and there's two that move uh, the other way. So, and then there's these bulk bands. So what you basically have now is a system which has modes that are traveling on the hinges of the system, right? And as you go from one hinge to the other, the hinge modes, they reverse sign. So they, on one hinge it goes up, on the next one it goes down, then it goes up again, goes down again. And um, these are now uh, protected. Uh, they, you, you cannot remove these hinge modes as long as you keep this mirror symmetry in the bulk, this, this diagonal mirror symmetry you cannot remove these hinge modes. And um, also, since this is now uh, a, a situation where we have spectral flow, we can basically forget about the chiral symmetry, right? So the chiral symmetry, similar to the transition from the Suschrieffer-Heger uh, chain to the uh, churn insulator, where we could drop the chiral symmetry once we figured out how the bands connect, here is the same thing for this uh, edge modes, uh, for the corner modes of the 2D system to be at zero energy, we need the chiral symmetry. But for these uh, chiral states at, at the hinges, we can forget about having the chiral symmetry. It's enough to have uh, the it's enough to have the mirror symmetry in the bulk. And um, okay, so that's basically that. And again, it's a bulk invariant that tells me a three D bulk invariant that tells me about these these corner modes, so I can do to the surface whatever I want, as long as I keep this mirror symmetry intact in all surface manipulations, I cannot get rid of these, uh, these hinge modes. Okay. So I have a little more than 10 minutes, and I have one page to go. So uh, are there questions on this one? Okay, you're very tired. Um, I understand that, but I would like you to switch on your brain for one, uh, for uh, for ten more minutes. And um, the reason is that I'll I'll switch gears a little bit, and I think this is very valuable um, because um, what you have seen so far in this school, and most of what you'll see for the rest of the time, is going to be exclusively on band structures and non-interacting systems. And I think it's important that we do not forget that there is a, you know, also a strongly interacting equivalent of all the things that we say here. So all these topological phases, they also exist in, in strongly interacting systems where we cannot just you know, draw band structures and, and understand everything. And for that reason, I wanted to um, quickly uh, tell you uh, about uh, SPT phases and give you the simplest example in 1D of an SPT and 
uh, a simple example of a higher order or crystalline SPT. Okay, let's see whether we can get that done in 10 minutes. Um, so, SPT phase. And it's more like an example, obviously, I won't develop the, the, uh, uh, the full theory, but it's just so that you basically have the oversight of what there is and, and, and you know, don't think always in terms of band structures. So what I want to look at is a 1D chain where each side has a spin one half degree of freedom. And the, the model that I'll look at is, is, is still exactly soluble in, uh, it's just, not you know, corresponding to a band structure, at least the way I present it. So on each side, I can act with the three Pauli matrices, and I'll just call them X, Y, Z, okay? And I would like to look at the following Hamiltonian, and I'll call this H topo, and that is on every side I, uh, I apply the operator X on the side I minus one, I apply the operator Z on the side I, and x on i plus one, okay? So I, you know, on this I, I apply x, z, x, apply here, x, z, x, and so forth on every side, right? The sum over all of these, these products, these products of three operators, that's my Hamiltonian. Now the first thing that you should note is that all of them commute, okay? So because z and x anti-commute, but they come twice in the neighboring operators, they all commute. So, um, so the ground state is just the state that, uh, that is an eigenstate, a simultaneous eigenstate of eigenvalue minus one of all of them. And, um, and now uh, I will also write a trivial Hamiltonian, um, which is the sum over i over set i. Okay, so that's a paramagnet, right? So all the spins are polarized. This is, this is certainly trivial. And now I'll tell you a symmetry that I choose to use, and that is a time reversal symmetry, which is given by the product over the set operators on all lattice sites time com times complex conjugation. And uh, the point I wanna make is that these two Hamiltonian are in different uh, topological classes with respect to this symmetry, okay? And uh, so how do I see that? Um, the, the easiest way of seeing that is by checking for end modes. And uh, so, I, so let's say we terminate this chain, right? And, and, and we want to look for, uh, so certainly in the, in the bulk, this is all gapped, right? Because we have, you know, uh, all, you see that since they're all commuting, the ground state has minus one times the number of these operators as an, as an eigenvalue, as an energy eigenvalue. And the first excited state would be one where I flip exactly one of these guys. And then it's, it's you know, the energy is, is higher by two. So it's, the ground state is gapped, okay? And the same is true here, right? The moment I flip one spin, the energy changes by two. So, so it's gapped, gapped ground state. And now what about the end of the system? And here I'll just give you three operators. They are set x on, the, so this is the last side. So the product of set on this side, x on this side, the x operator on this side, and the y x operator. So the y acting on this side, x on this side, okay? So these three operators, they have two things in common. The first thing that they have in common is that they all commute with the Hamiltonian, with this Hamiltonian, I'm talking about this one, right? They all commute uh, with, with H topo. Okay, the second thing that they have in common is that they are odd under T, so they anti-commute with T. Okay. And now what does that mean to have these three operators here? Well, it means that uh, they, they, uh, among themselves, they obey the Pauli algebra, right? So it's like sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. You know, that, that x here doesn't, doesn't matter, right? So they obey the Pauli algebra. So what that means is that there needs to be a twofold degeneracy in order to represent this Pauli algebra associated with the end of the chain, right? 
and, um, and this twofold degeneracy is a topological end state. And now you can ask me, well, can I maybe sort of lift this degeneracy somehow? Then it wouldn't be topological. But since all the operators um, that could lift it are odd under T, I cannot add any of them while preserving T to the Hamiltonian. So that's degeneracy uh, is a protected one, okay? So there is a twofold degeneracy at the end of this H topo. Obviously, for H trivial, there is nothing. It's just, it's just a polarized state. Okay, so that, did that sink in a little bit? Had a lot of time to think that it think 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 think, but it made sense hopefully. Okay, so then let's do this in two D and construct a higher order uh, topological phase with that in a similar spirit. Um, and here again, uh, so I'm looking at the two D lattice. I'll present again two Hamiltonians to you. Um, the topological Hamiltonian I'll write in a little bit of a more system, uh, schematic way. So I'll apply the set I operator to a side and the X operator, so it's a product of X on the neighboring sides, on the diagonally neighboring sides to this one. So, so what I mean by this operator is that I I apply Z here, I apply X here, 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 and here, okay? And then I do that on every lattice side, yeah? And uh, so it's clear what I mean by this Hamiltonian? And I, so, so it's this operator, it's the product of four X's and one Z, and I apply that to every lattice side. And then again, I have the H trivial, which uh, could just be sum over I, Z, I. My time reversal is still the same one as over there, but in addition, I want to um, use a mirror symmetry that permutes, uh, so I want to look at this mirror symmetry M, uh, that, that the mirror symmetry is just permuting the sides. It doesn't do anything to this in, in the spin space, okay? So M mirror symmetry Okay, so, I, um, so we have to do two things now. Um, the first thing is uh, we have to talk about the edge of the system, which I haven't done yet, and then we can talk about the corner, okay? So what can we do to the edge? Um, there's two options, and uh, one of these options is uh, to basically extend this Hamiltonian to the edge in the sense that uh, I put on the edge the terms that are set, so x set x. So if I have this edge, um, sorry, let's see. So that's option one. I put terms that are set x x. Again, I can put this on each of the edge sides, and um, the operators commute with themselves. They commute um, with uh, what is already in the Hamiltonian. So that's edge termination one, and it is certainly mirror symmetric because, uh, so it's time reversal symmetric, and it's also certainly mirror symmetric because, again, uh, the only thing I need to make sure is that I put the same thing on this edge as on the edge that goes downwards, right? The second option that I have is to put on the edge, so that's another picture of an edge. I put operators x, x on the edge, okay? So I put the product of x on two neighboring sides. And that um, is also fine uh, with time reversal symmetry. Um, and it also commutes with the Hamiltonian. So I seem to have two different edge terminations. But the second one is actually uh, something special in the sense that, uh, well, what will be the ground state if you just look at the edge? If you put xx on neighboring sides and you have a spin chain and you put xx, there's just the Ising 
model, right? It's like just the spin, the, the you know, depending on the sign, the ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic uh, interaction of neighboring sides. So if I put this on the edge, what will happen is that uh, my edge will spontaneously break uh, my time reversal symmetry. Okay, so um, so that is not good, um, and uh, and for that reason, so we always have to remember that topological phases are there is this caveat, right? We need to uh, uh, in interacting systems at least we need to not only make sure that the Hamiltonian obeys the symmetry, but also the ground state should not spontaneously break the symmetry. Otherwise, there is no bulk boundary correspondence or anything of that. So this edge is basically forbidden. Well, I thought this was colorful. Um, this edge is basically forbidden because it's corresponding to a spontaneous symmetry breaking on the edge, right? So this is an edge termination I cannot use. And now with this edge termination, I'm in business. This will add basically another number of constraints to the Hamiltonian so that the edge gaps out. And, um, and then I can basically talk about the corner. Um, so so with edge uh, one, then I can give you three operators on the corner, and they are, if I have this corner, they are given by set x by y x and by just x. Okay, so there's three operators. They all commute with the Hamiltonian. And um, they are odd under the product of mirror times time reversal symmetry. So they are, they are, they are basically satisfying the same two conditions that, that we have over here. So they are commute with this H topo. And they are odd under mirror times time reversal. And so I cannot add them as perturbations to the corner of the Hamiltonian if I want to preserve uh, this combination of symmetries, right? So, so what that tells me is that I have a localized degree of freedom, twofold degeneracy at the corner of the system. The bulk is kept, the edge is kept, and so this is also a topological crystalline phase, but this time it's an SPT phase. It's something that's you know, inherently interacting you see that this is like a lot of spins that talk to one another here, so there's no chance. I guess you can uh, Jordan Wigner this or anything. Um, so this was just to show you that uh, sort of not only in the realm of electronic band structures, but also in, in spin systems and strongly interacting systems, uh, all these notions of topology exist and, and many things carry over, but we have to look at them with, with different tools and, and, and uh, with a different uh, angle. Okay, so this basically uh, is the end of my third lecture. Um, so, questions? Um, yes, uh, so I think now one has to think about the sort of limits, you know, what is the radius versus uh, the correlation length and everything, but um, <clears throat> what you are guaranteed is if you have two surfaces which are gapped, then you'll have a gapless state, and, and, and they are sort of 90 degrees, for example, like in the case here, then you'll have a gapless state uh, somewhere between the two. That's guaranteed. But of course, if you make this region between the two very large, this gapless state doesn't need to be in the lateral direction, doesn't need to be very localized. It could be as delocalized as your, your basically your edge, determined by your edge, uh, by, the, by the radius you know, of curvature of your, of your edge. But it would still be, it's guaranteed by the fact that you have these two terminations which are 90 degrees with respect to not one another. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Exactly.
Yeah, exactly soluble, right. Uh, so, right, so the point is that you can now adiabatically, uh, if you can adiabatically connect this, the bulk of this Hamiltonian to a bulk of a Hamiltonian that is, that you're interested in, which might not have zero correlation lengths, while preserving the symmetries, then you're in business. So basically what will, you can do this with some unitary operation, uh, or some sort of, yeah, finite depth, local unitary people say usually, so you do something that's non, <coughs> that is preserving locality of the Hamiltonian, preserves the symmetry, if you connect the Hamiltonians, preserving the symmetry, then you're fine because you can apply that same unitary operation also to this simple end state that I con constructed here and you'll get a more complicated end state maybe that's somehow exponentially decaying or something, or about this operator rather. It's not really the state, it's not, you know, you can't think of an end wave function because it's not like a single particle picture, but you would then take, for example, this X operator you come with your complicated unitary and it will be a more complicated operator, but the weights will decay uh, on, the, on the side. So in that sense, these fixed point Hamiltonians are a good uh, starting point to think about the phase, but you know, whatever you can adiabatically connect to them is, is obeys the same physics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is unique, then it's unique. There is one, there is uh, for each, <coughs> so this guy, there is only one sigma z for each lattice side. And so, so there's no way, there's no sort of identity like in the Tory code that would, uh, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's short range, right? But the, 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 you almost said it, right? The, the entanglement is here it's short range and the Tory code it's long range, right? Or there is a topological ground state degeneracy on, on the torus. Uh, well, no, I think you have to stare quite a bit if it's sufficiently complicated. I mean, you basically have to see whether out of these stabilizers you can com you know, build an identity. Here it's, here it's simple to see it, but if maybe it's harder for other systems, so I, I don't know, yeah.